University of Michigan versus Lovely. Yeah, I think you would. Uh, good afternoon, Jonathan Evans, on behalf of the people. And Kenneth Overwater, Assistant Public Defender, on behalf of Ms. Lovely, who stands to my right in court. Okay, thank you. We're ready to proceed to exam. Defense is ready. Yeah, people are ready to proceed in this matter. Um, my understanding is that there's also some kind of a violation hearing. Did you want to do the exam and then kind of do everything all at once or however? Yes. You want to Perfect. That's. Um, I don't know if there's anybody else left. Um, I'm going to call my first witness, Corey Johnson, but I have the officer in charge, Dusty um, Patel, uh, also here uh, with us today. All right. Sir, please come forward. Reese Warren. Thank you, Anthony. Comments for our firm. Tell somebody about you. All right. Go. You may inquire. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and good morning, Mr. John. Or good afternoon, Mr. Johnson. Thank you for being here today. Um, just to kind of get right into it. Um. With the court's permission, I'm gonna. There's a child involved here. I'm just gonna refer to it as the child, so that I'm not putting his that, name. That is fine. Um, and in likewise, if defense could. Um, uh, do you have a Do you have a son? Yes. I do. Okay. And who is the uh, mother of that child? Uh, okay. And and just identify her. Okay. And is that somebody who you see here in the courtroom today? And how do you know Miss Lovely? Uh, she's white. Okay. And um, you guys are obviously uh, divorced then. Yeah. Uh, when was that um, divorce when did that become effective? 2019. Okay. And um, as such, out of that divorce proceeding, was there a custody arrangement that was entered into regarding your child yes. uh, in, in September of 2022? Yes. Can you briefly tell us what the terms of that, of that um, arrangement were? Yes, we each had 50 50 custody. Uh, joint custody, and okay. then we did our exchanges on Friday. Okay, and so is that one parent would drop them off at school, the other parent would then pick them up? Yes, if we your week by dropping them off on Friday, then the other parent would start their week picking them up. Okay, so I want to um, fast forward to uh, Thursday of, uh, 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 I'm sorry, February of 2023. Um, did anything change regarding that um, arrangement, that that custody arrangement. Yes, that uh, the first week of February, I would have had custody of my son, um, and I was contacted by. Investigating the complaints that she had made against me, uh, they turned out to be false. Um, so, I believe on the it was like the sixth, I con they contacted me and they said we're going to go back to normal custody. We advised her to continue like you should be, dropping them off at school, and I would pick them up, et cetera, et cetera. And that never happened. Okay. So February 6th of uh, 2023, I believe that was a uh, Monday? A Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. Um, you were supposed to have the, the child on what day? That Friday. That Friday so roughly the, the third? Yeah. I, I looked at a calendar earlier. Yeah. I I have to look at it. Okay. Um, well, hold on. I just want to make sure. On the third <clears throat> would have been your pickup, the beginning of your custody. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. And then that would have, that should have terminated with you dropping the child off on the 10th. Yeah, Friday. Okay. Whatever the Fridays were. Got it. All right. Um, and so then now turning to the 6th, of February, CPS gives you the okay to, to resume your, your pickup. Do you have any interaction with the defendant regarding the child exchange on the 6th? Yes, yeah, she contacted me on our family visit. Okay. told me she was not returning. Okay. Um, prior to February 6th, um, had you been 
observing her social media feeds? Uh, yes. Okay. And did you have any concerns about, about what the defendant was going to do with herself and the child? Objection, Your Honor, as to the relevance of what's on her, allegedly on her, uh, on her social media feed, certainly with regard to what he may have speculated he was worried about her doing. Well, but that goes to his state of mind as to everything. I'll overrule the objection. I'll hear it. Go ahead. Yeah, so had you been kind of monitoring her social media? Yes, I was concerned that she was going to take a uh, state. Okay. Um, did, with a specific destination? Uh, New York, that's all I knew. Okay. Um, and so did you share those concerns that you had with the defendant at all? Yes, I told her that would be a violation. Um, we had to we were required to provide my itinerary in front of work, and that never happened. Okay. So I verified that with Sarah Mazur. She said they hadn't received an itinerary, um, and that what she provided wasn't appropriate. Okay. So on the 6th, um, obviously the child does not return to your care. Okay. What happens then on the seventh? I contacted um, and law enforcement referenced the issue. Um, a order was uh, filled out and sent to the judge by a friend of court to pick my son up and return him to me. That was signed by Judge O'Brien. Okay. Um, did you anticipate that you were going to be able to pick up um, your child from school that day? Yeah. Okay. Did you reach out to the school at all? I did, and they told me that he hadn't been. Uh, brought that in. Okay. Um, I think he said it was like mental health or something like that. It, you obviously didn't. You obviously didn't excuse no. him. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Um, all right. The order. Uh, when you contact a friend of the court, did you were you able to receive a copy of the order um, from friend of the court? I did. Okay. Uh, I'm going to approach with what's been marked as people's proposed exhibit number one. If I may, Your Honor. Yes, you may. All right, Mr. Johnson, that exhibit that I've handed you, um, you've had an opportunity to review that before testifying today? Yes. And is that something that you're familiar with? Yes, this is the order that uh, they sent to the judge. Okay. To okay. And is that a fair and accurate copy of the order that was um, submitted and signed by Judge O'Brien at the 22nd Circuit Court? Yeah. Okay. Got it. And that's the order. What was that order um, informing uh, what was supposed to happen with the child? Uh, I believe, um, let me read it just to clarify. It says that she's supposed to return to me immediately and not leave the uh, state of Michigan. Okay. Um, Your Honor, unless there's any objection or voir dire on the issue, I'm going to move to admit uh, people's proposed exhibit number one. No objection for purposes of exam. Exhibit one is admitted. Did the court want to review that? Yeah. I'll say. Thank you. Thank you. Standard order. Okay. Go Thank ahead. you. So uh, now turning your attention then, so that February 7th, that order gets signed. You said that you contacted um, police. What agency did you contact? I contacted Northfield Township, and I believe it was a detective that called me back. He called me back. Okay. Um, I sent him that document that I had um, by email, and then he, he basically said because of the multi-jurisdictional thing that he was going to forward it to the state police. Okay. And as such, did you end up later that day speaking to Trooper uh, Pitzel? Pitzel. Pitzel. I did. It rolls off the tongue. Pizzle. Okay. All right. And uh, where did you speak to him at? Where did he come to your house? And in, in... okay, you spoke to him over the phone. Did he? Uh, well, you kind of explained the situation to him as best you could. Okay. All right. Um, moving forward to Friday the tenth. Had you received custody of your child by the tenth? No. Okay. Um, then moving forward to the 13th, that Monday, uh, February 13th, by that point in time, had you received um, custody of your child? Okay. And it's your understanding that pursuant to the order, 
the child was supposed to remain in your care until further order of the court. Okay. All right. Um, so then tell me what happens on the 14th of February. Had, had you, on the 14th of February, so this is Tuesday, had you received custody of your child? Okay. So what did you do or what happened in terms of, of that custody arrangement? And contacted front court and law enforcement and advised them that at that point she wasn't even in Michigan anymore. Um, and uh, I told you that her foundation was where she was. I, I, I can, if it, well, he is, as I understand his statement, whether it's true or not, that's what he's indicating. So there may not be foundation for what it is, and the court won't be able to whatever weight I give that statement, but I'm going to overrule the objection. Go ahead. Thank you. Go ahead. So I'm sorry, you, you reached out to the friend of the court. You gave them some information. Yes. What happened as a result of that information? They submitted another order to the judge. Um, and this was for her, this was terminating her parental rights and she had until the 24th. It's a call to Matum that she had to return them to the front court by then. That was the latest, but it was to immediately uh, do that. The okay. 24th of February. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, and uh, if I may approach with people's proposed exhibit number two. The 14th. Yes, you may. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, you've uh, been handed what's been marked as people's proposed exhibit number two. We just talked about the court order, the document in front of you. Do you recognize that item? Yes. Likewise, did you have an opportunity to view that before testifying in court today? I have. Okay. And is that a fair and accurate copy of the uh, order that was submitted and signed by Judge O'Brien on the 14th of February of this year? Yes, it Okay. Um, and unless there's any objection or voir dire on the issue, um, I'm going to move to admit uh, people's proposed exhibit number two. No objection for exam purposes, Judge. Exhibit two is admitted. <clears throat> All right, so then this order gets signed without telling me, without telling me what you spoke to. Had you been communicating back and forth with the trooper during during this period of time? Yeah. Okay. He advised the contact. Well, don't don't tell me what he told you. I just want to know if there was. So that communication, okay. And had you been communicating with the defendant at all, sending either via family wizard or otherwise? No, I sent her a message uh, stating that I was contacting the authorities. Um, she didn't turn my child. Did she ever respond in any in any kind of way? Okay. All right. Um. So then to finish this up, uh, when was the next time you actually received custody of your child? I called the school Wednesday or Thursday, it was like 16th, I think, that week. And uh, they said he was there, that he'd been dropped off. And so I told them that I would be there early and pick him up. And I had the order, I gave them a copy of that. And so they were aware that I had custody of him. Okay. All right, and that was and that was February, you believe, sixteenth of two thousand and three, that Thursday. Okay. Um. And again, at that point in time, to the best of your knowledge, between February, well, I guess sixth and February twenty fourth. So this is after communicating with CPS. To to I'm sorry, February sixteenth. Um, it was the defendant that was the only barrier between you and having custody of your child. Yeah. Okay. There was no communication that he was missing or anything to that extent. And in fact, had you spoken to your son during that intervening period of time? Okay. You had one phone conversation with him. You recognized his voice. Okay. <clears throat> um, all right, and I guess, um, how old is your child? Okay, so he doesn't, um, he, he, he might, may I guess, but he does he have a phone? Okay. So when you spoke to him, yes. how did you get in contact with him? We are required to call each other's cell phone. Okay. Okay, and so you, you called the defendant's cell phone and it was, you were able to speak to his son? Yeah. Okay, um, thank you. 
Um, you got it with that. I don't have any other questions for um, for this um, for this witness. All right. Before you begin cross examination, I just want to clarify one thing. The first order, that, sir, that was signed on by Judge O'Brien on May seven. Your there was an indication that the child was to be returned to you, that your understanding was that the child was supposed to be returned and remain in your custody. Yeah. As I'm reading this. Let's go back to 50 50, our regular agreement. Okay. I think that's that, no, that, that's fair. And had. I'm counting out the dates. Had the child the child would not have been returned to you really until the 14th, right? If I've got that it. Week. I would have I was supposed to have him that first week of the third. Correct. So you would you would have the third basically through the ninth, yeah. right? Then the defendant would have the 10th through the 4th, 13th. And then your next time would have been the 14th and beyond. The 17th. Or the 17th. Yeah. Whatever that Friday would have Yes, the 17th and beyond, I guess. Yeah. So I guess, okay, so here's, here's what I'm trying to figure out. I'm looking at this order, and I'll let you see it again, the, the order of February 7th. And it indicates that they're ordered to re immediately return the minor child to defendant's father custody, care, and so on. Had that order been effectuated on the 7th, you would have then had the child from the 7th to what, the 10th? Yeah. Okay. And that's what didn't happen. Okay. I didn't get him on the 3rd. I didn't have him. He was never returned. I never got him that week at all. Right. Yeah. So, but what I'm saying is the time, I don't know really what I'm saying. What I'm indicating is, you didn't get the child on the third. The order to return the child to you signed the seventh. But if everything were to go back, really, there's like three days from the time of the order that it didn't happen. I mean, from the time of these orders, right? Three or four days. Okay. The week then of. Well, let me just stop there for a moment, because one of the questions the prosecutor asked you then is, um, on that order, that that child that the child was to remain in your custody. That's not quite correct. On the seventh, is that right? I believe you are supposed. She's supposed to be returned to me so we can continue our parenting time. Okay, so. Okay, and that's something different. That's what I'm trying to figure out. On the seventh, the judge is ordering that the child be returned to you as though this interruption had not occurred. And then it would go back to the, the normal schedule, right? So from the 10th to the 17th, the defendant would have had primary possession of the child at that point, not really custody, but possession. Yeah. What interrupts that though, is then the order of the 14th, which then says, and this may have, I just wanna be clear on it because it may be what you were talking about, the 14th order. That order doesn't, as I'm reading it, isn't now referencing the parenting time. That order is saying this child goes to the father, that's it, until the court says otherwise. 
Is that your understanding? Yes. That's okay. Right. Okay. Pardon? That's how Frank explained it to me as well. I probably did a better job though, right? You did. Okay, thank you. All right. <laughs> thank you. No, it's okay. <laughs> All right. Cross examination. Just if I can just have a moment. Yeah. May I may I receive the exhibits? Mr. Johnson, are you currently employed? Yes, How? You do what? I work in Little Diablo Salsa. Little Diablo Salsa. Were you previously employed as in law enforcement? When were you employed in law enforcement? How long were you in law enforcement prior to that? You know, I guess I'm going to object to the relevance of the question. What is the relevance? Judge, if, if I'm allowed to understand his involvement with law enforcement, it might explain why he chose to involve law enforcement in this um, <clears throat> in order to deal with what is a civil matter. I don't know. <laughs> I'll let you go. I don't think it's going to matter to the court because if a child's withheld against the court order, I don't know that that's a civil matter. But I'll let you have your definition. Go for it. How long? Uh, when did you start working in law enforcement? And where did you work? I worked for Amber Township. Um, Northfield Township, and shortly, uh, a little short stay at like the local Stockbridge and reserve work. Um, prior to the reserve work, you, uh, Northfield, Hamburg, and Pinky, you were working there as a police officer. Yeah. Would you describe this, uh, the child custody arrangement in the course of your divorce as contentious? And this all started when Ms. Lovely filed a child protective services complaint against you, correct? This this particular incident. Yes. When did that happen? I believe it was beginning of February. Um, Amanda Moore contacted me from CPS in Oakland County. So early February, CPS contacted you, indicated that an investigation was being started. And you were told that it was based on allegations made by Ms. Lovely. Yes. Um, and you said, you testified that that, that uh, investigation was closed. Yes. When did that happen? That was the sixth. And how were you made aware of that? I spoke to a man who was the investigator. <laughs> On February 6th or February 7th, you said you contacted a friend of the court. Yeah. Did you also file an ex parte motion for, and that motion was denied, correct? Yes, because they um, authorized the other one that private court. But you filed a motion and that motion was denied. Yes. Okay. An ex parte motion to what? That was an ex parte motion to compel your parenting time, correct? Did I have no further questions? I don't have any redirect. All right. You may step down. Thank you. Any additional witnesses for the people? I'm going to call the trooper. And. Sir, please come forward to be sworn. Yes. Yeah.
I am Trooper Dawson Pitzel. You already spelled it. Yes, okay. That's P I T. Susan Charlie. Yeah. Why is that so hard, Mr. Edmonds? Just... And, and, and I just noticed that when you called him to the stand, you. <laughs> yeah, you use the last name. You just use his added, title. Okay, I'm just saying. You're on to my ways. I was paying attention, but go ahead. You may inquire. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Trooper Pitzel, uh, thank you for being here today. Um, uh, I want to turn your attention. How long have you been employed with the Michigan State Police? Uh, thank you. Uh, and in, were you employed in that capacity in early February of 2023? Yes. Did you uh, become involved? incident uh, between a custody issue uh, between uh, Alante Lovelay and um, uh, Corey Johnston. Yes. Thank you. Who did you first or how did you first get involved in this information? And again, I would respect it to the extent that you refer to the child, just refer to it as the child. Uh, at first, I was dispatched to an assistant agency. I was kind of arrived. For my dispatch notes, I was advised to contact uh, Sorry, Detective Buxton, I believe his name was. Thank you, and I think that's B-U-X-T-O-N. That's right. Yeah. Township Police Department. I contacted him, and he advised me of the dispute that we're here for today. Okay. Um, and uh, we had some testimony uh, earlier about the court order. As a result of that communication um, with the detective Buxton, were you able to receive uh, some kind of uh, court order in some kind of way? Yes, he emailed, he forwarded the email to me and okay. I was able to review and see the court order as well. Okay. After speaking to the detective, based on the information that he gave gave you, did you have a telephone conversation with Johnston? Yes. Okay. Did you get some fine information from him? A little bit more information of what Dr. Uh, detective Buxton was able to provide. Now you have the information from the Northfield Township Police, as well as from Mr. Johnston. Um, what was your next step of your investigation to assist with this situation? My next step was to make contact with uh, Ms. Lovely and uh, I guess attempt to persuade her to comply with the uh, court order. Okay. And did you do that? Yes, I did. Where, where did you speak with Miss um, Lovely? I spoke with her at her uh, residence in South Line. Okay. Um, and for all intents and purposes, that's, uh, I think there's a small part of South Lyon that's in Washtenaw County, but her residence is in the Oakland part? Correct. It is in Oakland. Okay. Um, and is the defendant, is that somebody who you see in the courtroom today? Yes. Just need you to point to her and tell us what she's wearing. Uh, it's a female with a kind of white shirt with flowers on it. Thank you. More kind of beige. And for the record, Your Honor, the, the witness has identified the defendant. Uh -huh. And record shall so reflect without objection. And thank you. Um, did you have a conversation with the defendant? Yes, sir. And uh, did you talk about the court order? I discussed it with her. We, we talked through it together, yes. Okay. And what was her response in regards to you showing her this order that she's supposed to return the child? Uh, she advised me that she would not return the child. Okay. Um, when she advised that she wasn't going to return the child, what did you do? I told her I would be in contact with her within 24 hours and um, to confirm whether she returned or not returned the child. Okay. Did you inform her of, of maybe some of the consequences of not returning the child? Yes, I did. I, I informed her that if she failed to return the child within 24 hours, that um, charges would be sent up against her. Okay. Did she, uh, in some way, show some kind of acknowledgement that she understood what you were saying? Yes. Okay. Uh, so then, did you follow up with the parties uh, at some point in time later? Yes. On uh, February 10th, I called Mr. Johnson again to confirm whether his son or whether the child had been, uh, and he advised me he had not been returned. Okay. And so, based on the information that you got from Mr. Johnson, did you then speak to Miss Lovely again? Yes. And what did Miss Lovely tell you about that? Miss Lovely told me that she once again did not uh, return the child, and that she questioned the validity of the court document that I provided her. Okay. Um, when she questioned the validity of the court document, did you do? Did you offer to do anything for her? I did. Yes. Okay. And what was that? I offered to. Uh, to I believe that was a Friday night. Courts were closed. I told her, hey, 
I'll go down to the sec or 22nd Circuit Court as well and um, confirm that this is indeed a valid document to prove to her that yes, this is a valid document. Okay, and did you do that? Did you follow up with uh, the 22nd Circuit Court? Yes. Okay, did you get some kind of confirmation about the validity of the document? Yes, I had spoken to uh, one of the clerks, I believe her name was Ms. Thompson, and she confirmed that that document was signed on the 7th by uh, the judge's name is spacing right on my mind here, but Judge O'Brien. Judge O'Brien, thank, thank you. you. And um, she confirmed that that was a valid document. Okay. And did you then relay that information to Miss Lovely? Yes, I did. Okay. So you've now told her about it on the 7th, gave her to the 10th to comply. And then on the 13th, tell her that, the, that it's a real court order. What was her response to you in, in regards to that information? Once again, she told me she was refusing to return the child and after a brief few words she hung up on it okay thank you you know with that i don't have any other questions for this witness cross examination thank you judge trooper in the four and a half years that you've worked for the state police is this a common thing common part of your duties I'm sorry, what, what do you mean as in, I, I guess is that, serving serving orders for child custody is that a common part of your duties in my four and a half years this is the first time i've had to do it so. the only time you've ever had to do it is in this case yes so it's unusual um and you indicated that you spoke well i guess let me circle back you received the order from uh detective buxton correct yes and where did Detective Buxton get it from? Um, he advised me that he received it from Mr. Johnston. From Mr. Johnston. Yeah. So Detective Buxton didn't get it directly from the court either. Unless he, unless he actually. To your knowledge. To my knowledge. Okay. So um, you then told, as you indicated, you met with uh, Ms. Lovely and you told her about the order and she indicated that she had doubts about its uh authenticity correct yes and you testified already but that she told you that a motion had uh, to that effect had been denied correct yes right so she asked you to independently verify that that was accurate yes. and you agreed to do that yes and you told her that you would do that yes okay um and then by the time you were able to do that was september 10th correct to, to verify was, the document was 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 authentic. The 13th, she didn't. February, excuse me, February, not September. She requested on the 10th for me to verify the document, not on the 7th. Okay, so you agreed to do it on the 10th, Correct. and then you verified it on the 13th. Correct. 10th was a Friday night, courts were closed. Right. The 13th would have been the earliest, that was Monday morning. So she had indicated, when did she indicate to you that she didn't, she was concerned about the veracity of the document uh, on the 10th. she didn't tell you that on the 7th i i do believe she probably did indicate it on the 7th okay i don't recall okay so things she told you on the 7th she certainly told you about the cps investigation on the 7th yes she did okay judge if i could just have a moment yes, you can. Did you ever attempt to independently verify that that order had been entered prior to February 10th? No. You didn't look into Odyssey or any other system? Yes, yes I did. You did? Yes. Okay, what did you do? I, it's not really a system I'm familiar with, mm -hmm. so I, I attempted to look through um, the online court system to see if any of that documentation, had, or through the family court system, mm -hmm. to see if that order had been uh, posted within it, and I did not see it ever. And when did you do that? I don't recall which date I did that. So would you agree that it was somewhere between the 7th and the 10th? Yes. So you were between the 7th and the 10th, you looked and you weren't able to see that that order was entered either. Correct. Nothing further, Judge. Thank you. Any redirect? I just want to reiterate. Did she express some doubt over the veracity of it on 7th of February of, of the order that you presented to her? Yes, she didn't think it was a real document. Okay. And then she might have also expressed some doubt on it on the 10th. Yes. 
that caused you to follow up with the with the court on the 13th? Yes. Okay. Thank you. I don't have that. All right. Thanks, Drew. Thank you. You're upset. Any additional witnesses? I don't have any other witnesses, Your Honor. Any witnesses for the defense? No, thank you, Your Honor. All right. Your Honor, at this point in time, my motion to find the defendant over on the charges contained within the information, the one count. Response. Your Honor, I object. Uh, first of all, it seems to me that based on the testimony, this entirely occurred in South Lyon. Um, so I'm not really sure that there's jurisdiction. This appears to have, uh, the child was in Oakland County the entire time. So I think there may be a question as far as venue. However, um, on the facts of the case, you know, the testimony is relatively clear from the trooper that he showed her this order on the 7th. She indicated to him that she didn't think it was accurate. They both, I think, uh, he independently attempted to look in Odyssey, couldn't find the order. Um, there was an order, a motion that was made and denied, which was testified to by Mr. Johnston. So at the very least, it makes it clear, I think, that there's confusion over what order would be entered or what order would be accurate if, if there was this motion was already denied on one motion and then entered on another. Um, Additionally, Your Honor, when the officer presents this to her and she indicates that she doesn't believe it's accurate, he agrees to look into it. Just a reasonable person would interpret that the officer is considering that possibility and is looking into it. If the officer is looking into determine whether or not the document is accurate or true, it's reasonable for a person not to follow it until they're told that it is. She or was, that they go and determine that themselves. And she attempt, well, I she hasn't testified that she attempted to do that yet. However, he need to prove that she attempted to do that. And it wouldn't have done any good because the officer already indicated that that, that that order was not in the system yet. Or that he couldn't find it. Or that he couldn't find it. But it does take time for those orders to appear. She couldn't independently verify it. By the 10th, that's now her parenting time. She hasn't received verification from the officer yet who's indicated he's going to look into it. He does. She gets verification on the 13th, but that order does not change. And the court indicated that order does not change her parenting time. Now she's into her week. So the child stays with her until the 17th. And then the child would go back to her to the child's father on the 17th, according to the parenting time agreement. That's obviously changed by the February or the February 14th order. But that's not really what we appear to be discussing here. The issue seems to be this time period from the 7th to the 10th. Because the order that issued on the 14th said she had until the 24th to return the child. And the child was, was taken by the father on the 16th. So we never got to the, to the violation of that particular order. So based on all of that, Judge, based on what the officer told her and what the officer did and how it would imply to her the possibility that this order is potentially untrue or invalid, he couldn't independently verify. He couldn't tell her that it was accurate until her parenting time had started. I would ask the court to dismiss the charges in their entirety. If, if nothing else, perhaps it's the basis of a show cause that could have been handled in family court, but as far as a parental kidnapping, I don't think it rises to the level to criminal conduct when the officer himself agrees to take on the task of verifying the veracity of the document. First one. I, I would ask the court, and I know the court's probably already aware of this. Anything that Mr. Our arguments are not evidence, but anything that uh, Mr. Overwater argued was that what she did, there was no testimony to that. So let's just focus on the evidence that we have. <laughs> take or retain for more than 24 hours the child with the intent to detain and conceal the child from the child's other parent. What do we have? On the 6th, CPS says that child that uh, Mr. Johnson testified, CPS indicates that child uh, custody is to resume as normal. Uh, at the 7th, uh, he's supposed to pick the kid up from school. school the, the child does not go to school that day. That prompts Mr. Johnson to then turn his investigation both to the police as well as friend of the court. He did this um, order. He talks with uh, the trooper, trooper turns around, talks to mom. At that point in time, mom is on notice. She says, I'm not returning the child. I don't believe that's real. Fast forward to the 10th. He tells her, you have 24 hours to do this or you could be looking at charges. She rolls those dice. She says, well, I'm throwing it. 
The 10th, nothing changes. Custody has not changed. Mr. Johnson testifies he has not he has not received um, his his kid uh, his child uh, in in those uh, intervening days. Trooper Pitzel goes back on the 10th, says, uh, "Hey, you know what's the deal with this order?" She says, "I'm not. I don't believe it's real. I'm not giving the kid back." Goes he verifies it on the 13th at her request. Verifies that it was in fact real. She says, I'm still not going to return the child. Um, it is what it is. Uh, 24 hours she had to uh, to return the child or, or comply with the custody agreement. Um, that order was entered on the 7th. She was made aware of it on the 7th. There's no testimony um, to suggest that there was anything else that was going on uh, other than there was this order uh, that she had to comply with and she didn't comply with it between the 7th and the 10th. So for that, Your Honor, the, as the court knows, um, this is an order out of our circuit court that gives this court venue and jurisdiction. Um, that's where the order arises out of. That's where the uh, underlying um, custody agreement comes out of this court, giving this court jurisdiction over this matter. Um, therefore, I would ask the court to bind, bind the defendant over on the charges contained in the information. I think there may be two bases for certainly venue and jurisdiction of this court, the one that's brought up by the prosecutor so I can dispose of that. It's enforcing a Washington County order. Also that their the venue is stated on the complaint is Northfield Township. There's going to be the one mile, certainly, for any conduct that occurs um, within that. So the court does believe it has jurisdiction and the venue is proper here. As with with respect to the elements of this offense and when it occurred, what a wonderful world we would have if defendants who were presented an order by a peace officer were able to say, I don't believe the order and just not comply without doing their own check, without doing their own, I guess, um, footwork on it. Certainly, officers may assist in that, but once presented with the order, it is the person who is subject to that order's obligation to follow it, check it, verify it, make sure they're in compliance with it. This defendant didn't do that. She just said, I don't believe this order, and then left it to everybody else. What is also clear from the testimony is, is that the parental father knows that it's his time and he has that order. He follows all lawful means to obtain the order. The order gets served on the defendant. The defendant says she doesn't believe it. The trooper told her she had 24 hours to comply with the order. She didn't. The question then becomes, well, and that's going to be from the period really from the 8th because of the 24-hour period to the 10th that she did not comply with the order. And that in and of itself constitutes that offense. I think it may be a question of fact for the jury as to what the... February 17th order means in terms of it going back because there are different interpretations. One interpretation of that order when I, on the face of that order, one interpretation is if you've interfered with my custody, then I basically take your week. So I still do the off and on, but now the, the weeks are reversed. That's one way to interpret that order because it's just week on, week off. The other way to interpret that order is we go back to the normal schedule. I don't know which way that order really reads on, on the face of it, but in either event, I mean, and that to me says that that's going to be a question of fact because it may very well be that the defendant then interfered with what would become the child's father's week 
that would have previously been her week because that week on didn't happen. So that, and that's a reasonable interpretation in this court's mind, certainly, and having seen it before of these orders. Under either analysis, and again, I'm not, I'm here to, to decide whether or not there's probable cause to believe that a crime was committed, not as to whether or not she has complied with the order, nor to necessarily give an interpretation of that order that's for other proceedings. Given all of that, the court does believe that the defendant has committed the offense of kidnapping, custodial interference, and that people have sustained their burden of showing that by probable cause, either so that we're clear, either as to that period after being presented with the order and not complying within 24 hours, or in retaining the child if there were a switch of weeks for that following week. Under either one of those analyses, the people have sustained their burden. Um, and therefore, the defendant is bound over to stand trial on this charge. I would now just see the information, Your Honor. I'll waive its formal reading, and my client will stand mute as the allegation. Defendant, every way, formal reading, standing mute. The court will enter a not guilty plea. All right. As a point of clarification, if I may. Yes. The court's recitation on, on the find over the court reference in order of February 17th. Oh, I meant okay. February 7th. Okay. Perfect. If I said 17th, I meant February 7th. Thank you. All right. Um, court will indicate the defendant standing mute. Enter a not guilty plea. Pretrial will be set for October 16th at 1 30 p.m. with Judge Slay. October 16th, 2023. 1 30 before slay is that a that's a monday that's a slay monday your honor there is the um violation i don't yes. know if to address that i do um so that we understand how we got here that the court had ordered miss lovely on July 27th, that there was to be no posting, um, commenting on social media uh, regarding this circumstance or particularly the child or anything having to do with this. All social media that she had previously posted um, regarding this case was to be removed um, and that the court was very specific that it included anything to do with the child directly or indirectly. That was on July 27th. We returned for a hearing August 17th. Um, the people, I think, filed a motion or a request to an emergency motion on the 9th, I think it was, to revoke her bond. Uh, At that time, the court reviewed it. The court, there was a partial hearing on that. Well, there wasn't really a hearing on that date when she came back on the 17th. Uh, based upon what the court saw in the court's previous order, the court did indeed revoke the defendant's bond, remanded her to the Washtenaw County Jail, um, had subsequently released her from the Washtenaw County Jail, but had set a bond hearing to address the issues in this case, because there was a claim that the subsequent posts were not with reference to the case. And that's where we are. And, and I believe that that, that that subsequent post was the something about a, a stalker, and then she re referenced that, or at least the, the indication was that that was in reference to a landlord or some kind of landlord tenant dispute. Correct. That is my understanding as well. Where was that landlord tenant dispute heard? And what was the name of the landlord? Uh, her name uh, is Evelyn Knox. Um, the landlord tenant dispute was at Water Edge Apartments. Where was the case heard? Um, there was no landlord tenant case 
We just had a eviction case coming from the property management. But there has been a police report filed for different disputes so though. Previous property manager. So there was no landlord tenant action that was filed? Not through the courts. There was a police report. Police have been called. Um, that may be only from the associated with the police. That could be entered from our eviction through part of the edge because of the situation of the old property manager. And that's what takes care of. It's my understanding that there was an actual court case, but um, within that's what I had. 50 seconds. Excuse me. The uh, right. That's Water's Edge Apartments versus Justin Hatchet and all occupants. So, who is Justin Hatchet? I believe that's her that's significant one. other fiance. Mm -hmm. We're both on the lease. He's just was named first. So how does this relate to that? There was an incident. Oh, oh, oh. I'm sorry, did you, how does what relate to that? How does the stalker relate to that case? Because I, I'm a bit confused only because before she had told me there was a landlord tenant case, then she told me today there isn't a court case, but now I find out that there is a court case and I'm now trying to relate the language that she was using to that case. Well, my client indicates, judges, that she was being harassed and stalked by the former property manager. Uh, what was the name? Amberly Knott. Amberly Knott. Um, and that's the person to whom she was referring when she made that post. There is an email addressed to Ms. or it's to you know, purporting to be to Amberly. Uh, I don't know if that's been tendered. You know, I just I find it interesting. Um, I, there was also this issue with the GoFundMe, yeah. right? And so the GoFundMe is the GoFundMe. I recognize it's been disabled. It has not been deleted. But in that language, when she's talking about what had happened, she says, still being harassed, stalked, manipulated, and talked about by my ex-husband. So she's referencing that same language um, that comes in, what was it? Uh, uh, in that in that post from I think July 27th, which which that apparently happens to coincide with one of our dates here. Yes. Um. So it, it, it's just too convenient. Um. And and I, I just I find it too remote to to refer to a stalker uh, as a or a landlord as a stalking because you know a landlord is a stationary kind of thing. It's the building. Um, so it's just, it's a strange, and it seems too remote. So Judge, the, the GoFundMe was early July. That was before, uh, I believe, the court's order is my understanding when that was created, and it has been disabled. Uh, a person can have more than one person harassing them in their lives. So while she may have had Obviously, there's a difficult relationship that she has with her ex-husband. That does not mean that she's not also having issues with this uh, landlord property manager. Um, again, this isn't the owner. This is the person managing the properties who's there in the area, is driving around in a golf cart, is watching her, and has been harassing her. That is what she's reporting. Um, I would ask the court, based on the vagueness of what that post was, to dismiss the bond violation. She's already spent, I believe, in jail as a result. 
Um, and I've admonished her to stay off of social media in its entirety during the pendency of this case. And I don't believe there's any indication that there have been any issues since um, she was released from custody. Um, well, let me just say this. I don't think the defendant believes any court's order. It distressed me, first of all, in coming back that there was a violation of my order. Right. Then when I'm listening to testimony here, Judge O'Brien issues an order. She didn't want to follow it. She just doesn't believe that people are going to issue orders that may affect her and that she can just decide to do things as she will. I hope her time in jail has sort of bemused her of that idea, especially when it comes to me. I think she's also going to run into a, a different type of animal. In, well, I don't mean that in a bad way, but a different type of judge when it comes to Judge Slay. And I would almost just dare her to not follow Judge Slay's order to the letter. Because seven days probably won't be long enough. What I'm going to do is I'm going to find that there's a violation sentence defendant to seven days, seven days credit for the seven she served. I'm also going to issue a new uh, order or as part of her order going up. Um, and I think it's wise advice, Mr. Overwater. Defendant is not to be on any social media. No use of social media. Ma'am, do you understand me? Thank you. Thank you. Otherwise, her bond will continue at this point. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.